Hey everyone, welcome to the Grandland video blog for books that came out on January 6th, 2010. As always, I'm Craig, your host. You may notice we didn't have a fancy little intro there. Uh, we're actually without our editing software, so this is, this is really one shot. This is all I got. Uh, if I don't make it, uh, I don't know, I guess I have to reshoot the whole thing. So hopefully this is the take that, you know, this is the first take, for the record. Uh, hopefully this will all go well. Uh, we got nine books to talk about. There's just not going to be any fancy titles or intros or outros or anything like that as you are normally used to. Those will be back next week. But in the meantime, let's just talk about comics. We don't need any frills. First up, Copper by Kazu Kibuishi came out this week. And uh, I, I've been a fan of Kazu Kibuishi ever since uh, the Flight Anthology started coming out. I, I discovered it a couple of years into the Flight Anthology and really, really enjoyed his work. He's kind of like the brainstorm behind it. You've probably heard me talk up the amulet on here before. I know the amulet came out in 2009. Part two of it did, and I talked that up. Um, Copper is a really fascinating book. Kind of uh, a boy and his dog, basically. It's a web comic, um, but there are a lot of things that have been published in the flight anthologies. This is a great all ages book, Scholastic, publishing it under their graphics imprint. Fantastic book, check this out. It's, it's the future of comics. He's a really, really well done, uh, really good writer. Just great story altogether. Grade 10, number 3 of 10, um, Thundermind versus the God of War. Uh, this is a very interesting idea. Now, when the Great 10 came about, of course, obviously, everybody kind of was fascinated by Accomplished Perfect Physician and August General and Iron and all these fun little names that all the, all the Great 10 had. But we didn't really get a chance to meet all 10 of them. And, and this is a situation where I don't feel like Thundermind really got his due, per se, any of the other times the Great 10 appeared. And right here, you really get a lot of respect for that character. Tony Bedard is doing a very fun thing here with this book and telling a very nice story. Uh, Scott McDaniel's art, if you can adjust to it, if you can get used to it, or uh, I was talking to Brad, Brad said he had a subscription in Nightwing during that time, so he's, you know, he's, he's used to that. Other than that, this is a really fun book, really great story, um, <clears throat> really interesting exploration of characters that are very, very interesting, very cool that Grant Morrison designed, and unfortunately I know he wanted to do this, that was at least the rumor was he wanted to do the Great Ten miniseries and it didn't happen because of time constraints and stuff like that. Still worth checking out. Um, the Mighty number 12 is here, and as I've said before, I kind of stopped reading at about issue 10 because I had to, uh, I had to cram it all in this week. So really I read all of this because it's fascinating, and really it took me um, very quick, very quick. Uh, I flew right through it. This series deserves attention. This series deserves to be mentioned uh, with some really fantastic stuff. Somebody should take copies of this and send it to Mark Wade over at Boom and send it to J.M. Dematis and say, look, you guys did Irredeemable in Life and Time's Savior 28. Uh, Peter Tomasi and Keith Champagne did your story right. Here's the creepy Alpha One guy who's, you know, it starts, it starts very ideal, you know, he's the only superhero, everything's okay, and then things start getting a little darker and a little darker, and I thought, I thought for sure it was going to end in a really bad way, and, and even the ending surprised me, having not read 10, 11, and 12 before I sat down and read it this week, and, and just the last three issues just blew my mind. I, I think in terms of 12-issue miniseries or maxi-series or whatever you want to call it, this stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the greats, you know? Um, I'm not going to call it, you know, Watchmen 2 or anything, but it's, it's that intellectual. It's that interesting. Um, it's a little graphic, but, I mean, hey, Watchmen's a little graphic. Um, it's good stuff. It's so good. I, I can't even possibly explain it without spoiling uh, all the different little tricks of the trade they have. Um, the art here, I was going to talk about the art. I feel like the art does a very excellent job. I mean, there's no times where you're sitting there going, I don't understand what he's trying to portray. I don't understand the storytelling. The art moves very fluidly. It doesn't have to be a John Cassidy or whatever. Keith Champagne just does, you know, here's the art. Here it is. It doesn't get in your way. It tells you a fascinating story. And when you're done, you don't realize that you're being told a fascinating story all that much because of the art, but you are. Moving from a very good miniseries to something that's not quite started out so well, Siege number one. Um, for months we've been told, hey, Siege is going to be this crossover where Norman Osborn invades Asgard. So in Siege number one, Norman Osborn invades Asgard. That's it. He beats up Thor, yes. Steve Rogers uh, gets to go, on the final page, and that's about it. That's all that happened in this book. If you haven't bought this already, I just saved you $4. Don't, you know, don't even consider it. Buy two, three, and four and find out what happens after that premise. Because, I mean, 
it's been said a couple of different reviews I've read of this book. People have said that, you know, uh, if they hadn't done that with this book, it wouldn't be good. But they did it with this book and, and everybody that bought it is kind of going, OK, I knew that was going to happen. It cost me four dollars. I get it. You know, in time, as it's as a whole, four issues, it's going to it's going to need this chapter. You know, it's not going to have the hype behind it for the rest of its existence. So. It's a necessary evil to tell a story like that, but it doesn't necessarily make it exciting to swallow that when it's $4. Spider-Man Noir, Eyes Without a Face is still going, number two of four. And again, this book just stays so good. There are some really fascinating things going on in here, really interesting stuff. I think that now that you're out of uh, Spider-Man Noir, the first series, where it was, it was kind of a whirlwind tour, you know, Let's meet this character and that character and that character and get it. They're all Marvel characters. Ha ha. You know, um, now that we've moved past that, now that we have like an established core, this is a very fun setting to tell stories in and, and some really interesting stuff as, as um, uh, Spider-Man investigates the crime master and Dr. Octavius and all these uh, characters and Robbie Robertson shows up and, you know, just some really interesting stuff is going on here. And, Really, really good storytelling. Uh, David Hine, obviously, I'm still a big fan of his from way, way back. Fantastic storytelling, probably the best noir book there is. Stumptown continues. Number two, Greg Rucka, Matthew Southworth. Oh, yes. Um, this book still has more twists and turns. If you, if you read Alias and you miss Alias, if you read uh, Mark and Draco's Manhunter and, and you miss it, other than the fact that it's a, a backup feature, if you need a conflicted, screwed up, if you liked Gotham Central and you, and you need your Renee, Renee Montoya fix without her being the question, this is your book. She's the private eye and she's totally screwed up, Dexedrine, <laughs> and she's, oh man, it's crazy. This is a fantastic book. There's no other way to describe it. Greg Rucka doing some fantastic work for Oni Press right here. Um, it's Greg Rucka. How could you not want to read this book? Gail Simone and John Ostrander bring you the Suicide Squad in this little funny uh, resurrection thing. But let's face it, this is an issue of Secret Six. That's all it is. And there's, that is not a strike against it, because Secret Six is still one of the best books that's out there today. Fantastic story with the Suicide Squad, with Amanda Waller, uh, Deadshot, you know, the development of Black Alice starting to get acclimated to the Secret Six. There's a scene with Bane and Ragdoll that is just already probably my favorite scene of 2010 where Bane sits down and uh, the stripper that's been dating Scandal comes in and, and Bane says, all right, I'd like to know what your intentions are with the young lady, you know, just this really funny father figure scene out of Bane and, and it's probably part of the best part of what Bane is in this book, but still great stuff. Uh, Jim Calfiore, like again, I, I saw him recently on an art credit and I said, well, you know, like where has he been since the mid nineties? But Simone Ostrander Califoyori delivering a great book right here, and it continues, it goes back into Secret Six. So really, this is just an issue of Secret Six with a Suicide Squad on the cover. Get it if you read Secret Six, check it out. X Factor Nation X is pretty much uh, what would happen if, um, if Peter David was forced to tie into Nation X, which is exactly what it is. It's a great issue of X Factor. X Factor has to go to Nation X and uh, talk to them and explain, you know, hey, yep, okay, we see what you're doing. We're not really coming here, but it's done with Peter David style, where he's just gonna he's just gonna grind into everything. You know, ever since ever since the mid '90s, when Peter David's all new, all different X Factor had to cross over into Executioner song. You know, there's always been this kind of undercurrent of writers who say, "I don't want my book to cross over with anything." You know, why do I have to participate in a crossover if it doesn't fit where I'm going with my story? And and you kind of get that that little you know that feeling from Peter David, where he kind of says, "Okay." You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go there, but I'm gonna have my team stick it to their team real nice. You know, and it, it, it reads really well. It is $3.99 because it's a one shot it, instead of just being an issue of X Factor, which they could charge $2.99 for. Hello, Marvel. Yes, take my extra dollar. I don't care. It's a very entertaining. It's the best X book there is. Uh, actually, it's probably tied with Astonishing X Men for the best X book there is. It's very close, but good stuff nonetheless. And then lastly, X Men Noir: The Mark of Cain. Uh, this is definitely taking a twist that I didn't really expect, but still not altogether bad. Very interesting. Fred Van Lente is still a very good writer. Dennis Calero doing some great stuff on art. And, and the end of this one, they're going to have to work to explain it, because right now it's, it's, it's just not, 
it's it's good, but but the more you think about it, the less you enjoy it. You know, that's kind of that's kind of how I feel about it right now. It's good, light fun. I mean, it's, nothing's light about the X Men Noir, but still, generally light. You know, as long as you're not trying to rationalize everything that's going on, um, mind blowing. But it fits. I mean, it's the X Men. It fits in what X Men do. You know, at the end of an X Men book, usually there's some sort of twist that you go, "Wait a minute, how are they going to pull that off?" And the good writers do, and the bad writers don't but they go with the twists anyways, and that's kind of where it is. So here's Fred Van Lenthe's test. Pull this off, Mr. Van Lenthe, I dare you. Um, fantastic stuff. This is great, of, just a stack of great books this week. Uh, thank you all for watching. Like I said, there'll be fancy credits uh, and titles and, and all that business that goes on around here next week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.